All right, as promised, here is our second video in this set of notes. So the last time we went through an overview of tissues, basic definition of what they are, how they work together, stuff like that. We looked at a few of the different types of tissues, focusing on the ones that relate to this unit that we're talking about. And remember, we'll hit the other ones like bones and blood um, as we get to those organ systems. The first semester is gonna be organ systems that are dominated by one tissue type. And then we'll start mixing it up as we get into the second semester. So our very first organ system that we get to do uh, is the one that's most visible, but I think people know the least about it, perhaps. It's the integumentary system. Uh, so the integumentary system is the skin, right? And so we're talking about the outside covering of our bodies. It's also the appendages, uh, including the skin, which is the tissues themselves that make up the integumentary system. Now, yes, your skin has appendages. Typically, when we think of appendages, we think of arms and legs and stuff like that, but it goes a little bit deeper than that. And we'll look at that here in just a little bit. There's also a fatty layer underneath that called the hypodermis, and um, that's uh, that adipose tissue. You know, it's, I'm not, I'm, I'm getting too far ahead. And then uh, you can divide up, so you can divide up the skin into two regions. The this is not the hypodermis. That's a layer underneath that that's associated with it. Okay, so we've got the epidermis, epi meaning outside, towards the surface. Um, and then the dermis, which is the layer beneath that. Functions of the skin, primarily it's for protection. It protects us from a lot of different things. It protects us from crashes. It protects us from water. Skin is waterproof. Uh, it protects us from heat, from cold, from bacteria and other pathogens, from chemicals. It protects us from ultraviolet light and uh, we get, and it'll actually use that ultraviolet light to synthesize vitamin D. Vitamin D is really important for uh, digestive health, mental and emotional health, um, bone and teeth development. Um, and so if you get like dairy products, for example, if they're fortified, they're going to have vitamin D because it's, you have to have vitamin D for calcium uptake. And when we get to bones, we'll talk about that in a little bit more. Also helps to regulate body heat. There's temperature regulation there, uh, prevents unnecessary water loss and sensory reception, touch, uh, you know, feeling something brush on your arm or landing on you or something like that. So we're gonna be looking at the epidermis. We're basically, we're gonna start on the outside of your skin and we're gonna go inward. So we're gonna start superficially and then we're gonna go deep. You, you know, trying to use those terms that we learned a couple of weeks ago. Now, something that's interesting about your epidermis, it's one of the places that's very mitotically active, we say. So the cells are constantly dividing. And so your epidermis is completely replaced every six to eight weeks. Interesting fact, most household dust is dead skin cells that flake off of the inhabitants. So you're welcome. Um, we technically, so the official name of epidermis or skin is keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Now that's a lot, but we need to break that down a little bit, right? So epithelium, that's the type of tissue. Stratified squamous tells us, help me out here, that it's in multiple layers. Good. Squamous tells us that they're flattened like skin cells. Now, keratinized means that they are full of keratin. Keratin is a protein, it's very strong, it's very tough, it makes up fingernails, it makes up hair, um, and your outermost skin cells are full of it. Um, that's what makes them waterproof and very strong and things like that. So there's, very, there's multiple layers uh, that we're gonna be looking at when we're looking at the skin, okay? We're gonna be focusing on this side right here for now, and then we'll move on to the purple side here in just a little bit. So we're gonna talk about specific cell types that you find in skin. Now, keep uh, something to keep in mind, this is all still the same type of tissue. It's all epithelial tissue, okay? 
okay. Um, so these are all epithelial cells. There's just a bunch of different types of epithelial cells, but they're all doing the same function, okay. Um, let's see. So starting with the outermost cells, there's four types. Let me go ahead and say that. Four types of cells. So we're just going to start with the outermost cells. We have the keratinocytes. Uh, and those are outermost, the outermost living cells. Now everything past this section right here, so all of these cells, they're all dead, okay? Um, and so what we have with these cells is uh, they're the most abundant, all of these cells. All of these cells in here, right? Um, they produce keratin, which is a tough fibrous protein, like I mentioned. And then basically what ends up happening is um, the cell dies, getting into the different layers. Um, and so you have the structure of the cell, but the actual cell is not living. When we get into the tissue layers on this side, we'll go into a little bit more detail of what's happening with those cells. So we've got keratinocytes. Then we move in these dark colored ones down here at the bottom. Those are melanocytes. They're dark colored cells, and they're the ones responsible for making the skin pigment melanin. Now, if the, so your, your skin color is dependent upon how much melanin you have in your skin. The darker your skin, the more melanin you have. And there's a lab that we're gonna do next week, at some point, that's gonna look at that. And there's some, there is some definite evolutionary uh, relationships between where you're originally from. So like, I guess historically, maybe not historically, um, evolutionarily speaking, where you can trace your ancestry back to, okay? So the darker your skin color, the more sunlight uh, was in your environment. And we'll look at that and we'll kind of talk about that when we get into why your skin is important, why UV is bad and stuff like that. So moving onward, we have Merkel cells. So these little purple, they kind of look like a little jellyfish hat. Um, and these are uh, associated with sensory nerve endings. So these are your touch, these would be like touch receptors and stuff like that. And then if you look down at the bottom, this little line right here is the nerve ending that it's attached to. And so that's gonna send the Merkel cell is like a sensor, and then the nerve ending is the wire sending stuff to your brain and things like that. Then we got Langerhans cells, these sort of bluish ones, and they have these uh, filaments that go off of them. Um, so we call these dendritic cells. Um, den dendrites are sort of long extensions that come off of cells. And these are associated with the, excuse me, with the immune system. Um, these are antigen presenting cells. And so basically they sit in your tissues with all these little sensor flags. And if something, some sort of foreign object comes into your skin, like if you get a cut or a scratch, these Langerhans cells are going to initiate the immune response and inflammation and stuff like that. And we get into greater detail about that about uh, March or so. So we'll end up revisiting those cells. So now we're gonna be looking at the actual layers. So they're labeled out on the right-hand side and then we're gonna focus on the explanations on the far right. Left-hand side is the layers, right-hand side is the explanation. So we're gonna start with the deepest layer first of the epidermis. Now, if you look at the picture down here at the bottom, we do have this section right here called the dermis. We're not gonna talk about that yet. So we're talking primarily about this section right here, okay? That's the epidermis. So the, the, the deepest layer of the epidermis is the stratum basale or the 
I'm going to struggle with these words, I'm sorry. You think I would have known by now. Uh, germinativum. So this is a single row of cells down here at the bottom. Let me highlight this for y'all. So it's this layer right here. These are the mitotically active cells. So remember when we said your epidermis is replaced every six to eight weeks? This is where it happens. And then the cells, as, the, as this base level divides, it pushes cells up into these higher levels. Um, it's attached to the dermis. This is what anchors the epidermis to the dermis. And these are all the youngest cells. So right now you've got some of these cells that are dividing and in about six weeks they're, they will literally see the light of day and then flake off. Okay, so moving up from the stratum basali is the stratum spinosum. Um, it's a thick intermediate layer where the cells are gonna start flattening uh, and turning into those uh, waterproof cells that we have. Now an interesting bit of trivia, it's stratum spinosum because originally when we looked at them under the microscope, they looked spiny. Well, and it turns out as microscope technology got better, the reason why they look spiny is because we did something to them. And so that, that is known as artifactual. That particular spiny characteristic is artifactual. They're not actually really, really spiny. However, the name stuck, and so there we go. And so if you're looking at this, this is the one of the thickest standard layers in skin, uh, characterized by the cells flattening, okay? Moving up from there, we have the stratum granulosum. And so now at this point, we've got cells that are becoming very, very flat. The organelles are going to deteriorate at this point, or they're going to start deteriorating. Your cell's dying if it's not already dead, basically. And then essentially there's all these little granules full of lipids and keratin, or at least the precursors for those things. Um, and so this is your intermediate step before we get to the very last step. Now in some cells, we have what is called the stratum lucidum. That's an additional layer, but it's only found in thick skin. And so these are places that need a lot of grip or traction. So we're talking palms of your hands, soles of your feet. So if you look at the two pictures side by side, uh, you can see Another thing that's different is the stratum corneum, which we'll talk about in just a second, that outermost layer, is really, really thick. And then we have this additional layer right here, that orange layer, that is the stratum lucidum. So it's a very, very thin layer that's only found in thick skin. Um, and if you look at the other side right here, the stratum corneum, that outermost layer, is very, very thin because it doesn't need to provide a lot of protection. We're not doing a whole ton of interacting with the environment uh, as we do with our hands and our feet, right? We're walking on the ground, we're grasping tools and cl you know, climbing up mountains and things like that. The very last layer is the stratum corneum, and now it's a thick layer. Now, some, you'll hear it described sometimes as a horny layer, and that refers to what is in the cell. So, if you think of horns on an animal, horns on an animal are very similar to um, hair or fingernails. They're both made out of keratin. Uh, rhino horns, for example, um, are like that. Now, elephant tusks are different because those are teeth, so that's a different process. But uh, actual horns are similarly structured and in, similar in composition to hair and fingernails. And so this layer, these are said uh, dead cells. This layer is many layers thick. Uh, and basically the cells are just sacks of keratin and lipids. Uh, and the name corneum refers to the process of cornification, which is basically filling cells with keratin and lipids, dehydrating them uh, and creating that waterproof layer that I had mentioned earlier that happens, that starts happening in the stratum granulosum. So these are the dead cells that flake off um, naturally, 
Okay, and so they're constantly being replaced. And remember, the stratum basale is constantly dividing, so we're pushing layers up. And as we're pushing layers up, layers are flaking off. Now, one of the things we'll see once we get into the actual projects is there are some skin disorders that are characterized by a buildup of this layer. So you have thickening of the skin, the formation of hard plates and stuff like that. Um, so this is just real quick, we'll show a picture of a, a photo micrograph, so a picture under the microscope showing the different layers. And one thing that uh, is really interesting, and we'll, the, that gets into what we're talking about the dermis, it's not flat, okay? It's, uh, it's wavy, it's got ridges and stuff like that. And that has to do with particular layers within the dermis. Um, now, we just talked about epidermis, right? There's four basic types of tissue. The reason why we can say skin is an organ is because it is made up of more than one tissue type working together to the same function. That is the definition of an organ. And so your skin, your in, the integumentary system is made up of epithelial tissue and connective tissue. And the connective tissue is the dermis, that underlying layer at the very bottom. Uh, so here's a picture of your skin. What everything that we just described is in this layer right here. So there was a lot of things going on, but the layer is very, very thin. The majority of your skin that we're talking about is actually going to be the dermis, which is all of this pink stuff right here until we get to those little uh, like yellowish bubbles, okay? So your dermis is very strong, flexible connective tissue, so like your loose, that loose connective tissue that we had mentioned in the previous video. Uh, cells that are in here, we have fibroblasts, which are fiber producing cells, macrophages, which are a type of white blood cell, mast cells, which are also a type of white blood cell. They're responsible for the immune response, um, and then other just sort of general white blood cells. And so the immune response is gonna really, really be mounted at this layer. Those Langerhans cells that we had mentioned, those are your sensory cells. Uh, that will trigger this response. Uh, fibers, we have bits of all three, collagen, elastic, and reticular to give a lot of flexibility, especially like here in the joints, right? Um, where we want to have movement, but we don't have a lot of tearing of the tissue and stuff like that. Uh, lots of nerves and blood vessels. If you've ever gotten a scrape or a cut or something like that, um, it bleeds a lot compared to other places. And we want it to be highly vascularized because the, the, the cells are very active, they're constantly dividing it. So we want them to get plenty of nutrients. Uh, and also detecting what's going around in the environment. This is gonna tell us if it's too hot, if it's too cold, stuff like that. Uh, we also use internal temperature for that sort of thing, but if something is too hot, your skin is gonna be the first thing that's gonna tell you that. If it's hot outside, your skin's gonna tell you that. And so it's very critical in maintaining uh, body temperature um, if it's too high or too low. There are um, two layers of the um, dermis, the papillary layer and the reticular layer. Um, the papillary layer is uh, areolar connective tissue. So remember from the previous video, and if you don't remember, have your notes handy or go back and review that. Uh, this is a very uh, highly vascularized, light tissue, uh, very flexible and things like that. Um, and it has structures called dermal papillae. Uh, they're basically kind of like little rough edges uh, or, or you know, kind of like fingers or something like that. The best way I can think of to describe it is a crate foam or think of an egg carton or something like that. Um, you know how there's like the little ridges in the valleys and stuff like that? That's dermal papillae. And basically what the dermal papillae do is um, increases surface area uh, and allow a place of attachment for the epidermis. So it basically uh, it increases the surface area for the point of attachment, so your epidermis stays on your skin. Now, there are some uh, disorders that are characterized by a loosening of that, and so basically your skin kind of slips off and slips around, and it's not very good because that's your first line of defense for you know, a whole ton of stuff.
right? Then right underneath that is that reticular layer. And this is by far the thickest layer out of all of the stuff that we're talking about, okay? And so we're gonna find our uh, appendages in there. And so we call it the reticular layer because it's a reticulum of collagen fibers uh, and reticular fibers. And reticulum is just a fancy way of uh, network. So this is where that network of fibers that makes that extracellular matrix um, is basically where it's created and where it exists. And then so all of the other cells within this layer are embedded in this network, okay? And so we've got a, uh, we've got a lot of um, different things in there. We have muscles, erector pili muscles that will actually make your hair stand up if you're having goosebumps, that's what that is. Oil glands, sweat glands, hair follicles, and the actual root of the hair itself. And we'll talk about those here in just a second. Um, okay, so we have fingerprints, we have palm prints, we have footprints, right? There's little ridges on all of those things. And so the dermal papillae sit on top of dermal ridges, right? And so uh, everything above that then, remember that micrograph that we saw of the skin and how it looked all wavy and stuff like that? Well, this is why. And so all of those ridges underneath push their way through and so they manifest themselves on uh, the surface of your skin. And so that's where your fingerprints come from. Uh, and uh, they're also, they form uh, sweat films because of the sweat pores there as well. Uh, they are genetically influenced. So here's something that's interesting. And in forensics, if you've, either if you're taking it or you've taken the course, uh, they're genetically influenced. However, your adult fingerprints are not solidified uh, until the first few years of life because your fingerprints are determined by the environment around you and especially within the womb. So that's why two genetically identical individuals, identical twins can have different fingerprints and it's a very good identification system. Um, so you can also have flexion creases. So if you look at your hands, right, you can see them on my fingers. Uh, if you look at your elbow, the inside of your elbow, your knees, your ankles, uh, your wrist, you can kind of see right there. I'm not flexing it, y'all, I'm sorry. Um, and right in here and stuff like that. And then if I go like this, you can see those right there. And so those allow um, movement, right? And so these are deep fold. These are folds deep in the dermis. They're permanent folds. And they allow, uh, that's just where movement takes place. And so like these creases, those, those are just my creases. That's what they look like. Because every time I bend my fingers and close my hand, uh, it closes like that. Uh, let's see, so fibers that we have in here and how they relate to all of this stuff. Um, collagen provides strength and resilience. So when, you know, when you're young, you push into your skin and it springs back up, right? As your collagen fibers break down, that's when skin starts to get saggy. Um, uh, and you can start to have wrinkles and things like that, right? And so then people do collagen treatments to sort of plump the skin back up. Uh, elastic fibers are uh, allow for stretch and recoil. So you can go like this, basically, and then it comes back in place. If you don't have those elastic fibers, there's another skin condition that's characterized by a breakdown of elastic fibers. And so your skin just sort of hangs and you can pull it and it just stays there. Uh, kind of like putty, but not the exact same consistency. Um, and so this is where you get stretch marks, uh, which are called striae. Uh, if the skin is stretched too much too quickly, then it creates those stretch marks. Uh, you can also get tension lines, um, which are, uh, uh, those show up in the direction um, the bundles of fibers are directed, um, where things split and stuff like that. And then if anybody, so here's another interesting thing. If anybody has uh, tattoos, one of the reasons why it hurts so much is because you are sending that ink into the dermis where all of that nerve tissue and vascular tissue is. That's also why uh, they sometimes they bleed a lot. And when you're getting tattoos and how you're treating them, you have to, they ooze a lot because you're puncturing into that dermis and so you have to it takes a while for your skin to basically heal all those teeny tiny little holes that you're putting in there and that's also why the tattoo lasts it's not 
100% permanent because you do have those white blood cells that are breaking down those chemicals and there is some cell division that's, that's, that is happening in the dermis. That's why the tattoo starts to spread out and lose definition. Um, but you're not losing, those dermis cells are not flaking off and going away. Uh, if you've ever had a henna tattoo or you get a permanent marker or something like that, eventually it fades away because the cells that have the ink on them or they, they flake off and they go away. With tattoos, it doesn't do that. It's beneath all of that stuff. And so that's why it stays for so long. Uh, so underneath that is the hypodermis, where that's Greek for below the skin. You could also have heard the word subcutaneous. Doctors like to say sub-Q. If you've ever had to have a shot uh, uh, or vets, a lot of vaccines that they give dogs and stuff like that are sub-Q shots. Uh, which is below the skin, so they pinch up the skin and then they drive it down in there and they give the shot. Subcutaneous is Latin for below the skin, uh, so either one of them works. Uh, this is also known as the superficial fascia, and this is the connective tissue. Um, fascia is a band of connective tissue, and that basically just holds everything together. And so the hypodermis layer is fatty tissue. It anchors the skin to the rest of the body. So you have areolar tissue, we've got adipose tissue. The fat part is the adipose tissue. Um, and so there's a disease called, uh, uh, fat, oh, you know what? I don't remember what it is off the top of my head. So we'll have to look it up here in just a second. But basically this tissue breaks down um, and necrotizing fasciitis. Uh, that tissue layer dies and so your skin is not attached to your the muscles and everything like that underneath. It's super bad, it's super gross. Um, let's see, uh, also within this layer there's different patterns of accumulation between males and females um, that has to do with like evolutionary needs and stuff like that, which muscle groups need um, energy the most, the fat's going to be stored close to them and stuff like that. Um, skin color, so I kind of mentioned that a little bit. So when we're talking about skin color, there's three um, skin pigments, okay? Melanin is the most important, and there's two of those subclasses, eumelanin and pheomelanin. Uh, one gives browns, one gives reds basically. You've also got carotene, which gives you oranges and yellows. Uh, this is really important. You get it from red and orange vegetables like carrots, uh, yellow bell peppers, stuff like that. Uh, and hemoglobin, which gives the skin its pink color. Now, uh, uh, albino, uh, uh, albinism is the uh, is the characteristic of lacking skin pigment. And so typically people with albinism have very pink skin because the only pigment that's coming across their skin is coming from the hemoglobin. That's why it looks pink. Uh, other skin colors are determined by um, your levels of these different skin colors. Um, the, the melanin especially um, in your skin, the darker your skin color, the more melanin. And so basically what ends up happening is melanocytes create these little melanin granules and then they um, pass into the keratinocytes higher up in that like stratum uh, spinosum and granulosum. Uh, and so it's these granules, the number of these granules or the, the volume or accumulation of these granules that determine your skin color. So these granules end up being digested by lysosomes. Here they are again, right? The great digesters. Um, explain variations in color, and then um, they help protect us from UV light, but at the same time, generating vitamin D. And now there's this trade-off that we're gonna look at when we do the lab. Um, you can either have really good UV protection, or you can have really good vitamin D production. You can't really have them both, and so if, you have, if you're really good at one, you have to be able to offset the deficits on the other one, if you're really good at producing vitamin D, you're at a greater risk of developing skin cancer because of all, you don't have that ultraviolet light protection. And then the reverse is true also. We'll look at that, like I said, when we do the lab next week. Well, uh, well depending on when you're watching this, we're gonna do a lab where we're gonna explore this relationship. 
All right, so looking at the appendages then real quick. These are located within the dermis and the epidermis, and they include hair and hair follicles and the different glands. And so there's two different types of glands. They're exocrine glands that we had talked about at the tissue video, right? So these have ducts that secrete fluids typically into spaces or channels. Um, these will actually go down through ducts into, onto the surface of your skin. Uh, nails are another appendage. Um, Nails are made of hard keratin. They are uh, similar to hooves and claws in other animals, okay? They're kind of like our hoof. They would be like our claws, okay? But they're not all that good as claws. Uh, they grow from a nail matrix, uh, which is basically the other way, other way you've probably heard it described is the nail bed. Um, and uh, their purpose is to protect the fingers, the tips of the fingers and the toes. Okay, so we've got hair, which is another appendage, and the follicles, which are forming, they form a complex, okay, that they are derived from the dermis and the epidermis, and hair is found pretty much everywhere on the body, except for places like the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. You don't want to have uh, anything inhibiting your uh, ability to grip tools or walking surfaces and stuff like that. And they have um, little muscles called erectile, erector pili that will actually um, make the hair stand up. So if you've ever had goosebumps or anything like that, that's what's going on. Those actual little bumps, that's that muscle contracting and lifting that hair up. Uh, let's see, some of the functions of hair, uh, it provides warmth, however, less so in, met, in humans, than in other mammals, we don't really have that much fur on us, so it doesn't do all that much to keep us warm. But other animals like bears and dogs and cats and stuff. Um, also, it's useful in detecting um, very light touches on the skin because if uh, you brush up against the hairs, you really notice that, you can try it. Uh, whereas you try to lightly brush against pieces of you know, exposed skin, you don't sense it quite as much, okay? Uh, you can also, it provides protection, especially most of our hair is up at the scalp where our brain is, and so it helps provide protection. It makes it difficult for things to, uh, you know, get in there, eat us and stuff like that. Um, in lions, the reason why male lions have manes is to protect them from other lions, basically, when they're fighting and stuff like that. Uh, parts of hair, uh, there's two main parts, basically. There's the root, which is embedded in the skin, and then the actual shaft, which is the part that you see extending above the surface. Hair is pretty much all keratin. So uh, some people say that hair is alive and we have to keep it healthy and all that other stuff. And it's not alive. You can keep it healthy. It is a basically a protein complex. And so uh, shampoos and stuff like that that you can put on like with protein complexes and stuff like that are, are actually uh, beneficial because your hair itself is basically a, a protein complex. And there's three layers concentrically. So if you do a cross section um, cut, so you're looking at the, the, the wide part, there is the medulla, which is the inside, the cortex, which surrounds the medulla, it's the thickest part, and then there's the cuticle, which is the outside. And so typically if your hair is kind of like flaky and stuff like that, uh, or if you've got split ends or whatever, this is kind of what we're looking at. Uh, the types of hair, there's a bunch of different types of hair. There's vellus, which is very fine or short hairs, intermediate hairs, and then terminal hairs, which are longer and coarser. So think uh, like hair on your head. Uh, hair growth is um, about two millimeters per week, so weak, so not super fast. Um, if it's uh, active growth, then uh, it's growing. If the rest, then it goes into a resting phase where its growth stops and then the hair is shed and then the process starts over again. Hair loss um, is typically some sort of thinning. It's most often age related. Um, you stop producing hair, you start going through that active growing phase, and when you shed it, you just don't replace it. And in males, it's most commonly it's male pattern baldness, so you get, you know, thinning of the hair, receding hairline, and stuff like that. You know, you start to lose hair here, 
Um, you get wispy stuff kind of on the side and stuff like that. It can also happen in women, but it's far less common than it is in men. Uh, hair color is determined by melanin. Okay, so we're coming back to that. Brown or black is eumelanin, red is pheomelanin. So if you have very dark hair, you have a lot of eumelanin in it. If you are of predominantly Irish descent, then your hair is probably red, you've got, or Scottish or whatever, um, you've got a lot of pheomelanin. If you're uh, really light hair or white hair, that means you don't have a lot of melanin and you actually have air bubbles in the medulla. So you've lost a lot of that pigment. Um, it's primarily genetically determined, but it's also influenced through hormones and the texture of your hair is also determined, uh, influenced by hormones. So that's why um, a, a lot of times, if you're a small child, your hair is one texture. And then as you go through puberty and you have all those hormonal changes, your hair becomes a different texture. Uh, my hair was very, very straight when I was younger. By the time I went through high school and into college, after I finished puberty, my hair, when it grows out, it's really, really curly. And you can kind of see a little bit um, that it's happening and stuff like that. Um, my little sister was the exact opposite. So maybe you have similar stories going on in your family too. Uh, other glands, other accessories that we're looking at, oil glands, also known as sebaceous glands. So they secrete something called sebum, uh, which is oil basically, and they cover, you have oil glands over the entire body, except for the palms and the soles. Again, we don't want anything to decrease friction between the main appendages that we use to uh, interact with the environment with. The oils, the sebum is, uh, the oil provides a layer of protection against water and moisture loss, and it also helps lubricate um, different areas, so you're not, rub like skin doesn't rub together and, and cause um, irritation and stuff like that. You've also got sweat glands. Sweat glands are super important. Also exocrine glands covering almost the entire surface of the skin to prevent overheating. So you get too hot, you sweat and the heat that's in the water evaporates and it carries that energy away. Uh, you can sweat anywhere from 500 cc's to 12 liters a day. Most of your sweat is going to be water. Um, only mammals have sweat glands. Humans are by far the most efficient at using sweat as a temperature regulation method. Dogs, for example, can sweat, but it's really only through the pads of their feet. Um, primates, other primates can also um, uh, sweat, but not as well as humans. And that's one of the ways that humans were able to gain an evolutionary advantage was our ability to regulate temperature. Uh, you also sweat in response to stress. So you are about to go into a job interview, um, big presentation, you start sweating, right? That's a stress response. You may not necessarily be overheated. We've got a few different types of sweat glands, ecrine or merocrine. Uh, are the most numerous. They produce true sweat, which is mostly water, some salts, um, little bits of waste. Um, these glands will open through the pores in your skin, and so that's how you sweat out. You've got apocrine sweat glands, which are in the armpits, the genitals, and the anal areas. Those are areas where, um, like, skin, there's a lot of skin to skin contact, and there's not airflow and stuff like that. Um, the ducts open onto the hair follicles, not directly on the pores in the skin. So the sweat will actually sort of seep down the, the hair, the channel that the hair is in and then come out with the hair. Um, there's a lot of organic molecules in these. And so that's where the odor comes from. When we get older, you know, about middle school or stuff like that, you know, you, kids, you, people start smelling funky in the armpits and that's when you get the whole deodorant conversation and stuff like that. This is why it's because of these sweat glands. Uh, and then you also have modified apo, apocrine glands. Um, and really, you only find those in two places. One of them, you find them in the ear canals. So those are ceruminous apocrine glands. And those are the ones that secrete, secrete earwax, which is a modified version of this. And the other one are uh, mammary glands in females, which uh, have adapted to secrete milk. And we'll get into that whole milk production process when we get into the reproductive unit. 
Uh, let's see. So then disorders of the integumentary system. This is something that we're going to hit on with every single organ system. We look at what happens when this organ system breaks down and leads to these different diseases. And that's going to be a big thrust of what your project is going to be, basically. And so a really significant disorder or damage to the integumentary system are burns. Burns are really, really serious. Um, they have a very significant threat to life because they can lead to a, a terrible, catastrophic loss of body fluids because your skin helps keep that moisture in. And so we're still using moisture. Right now I'm talking to you, I'm breathing, you're sitting there, you're listening, or maybe you're sleeping, you're also breathing. We lose water that way. Now, if we didn't have skin, we would lose water a lot more quickly. Frogs have this problem, right? That's why they stay close to water. Um, and so dehydration and circulatory shock because you don't have enough water for your blood to circulate, um, severe lowering of blood pressure. Uh, it can also lead to infection because this also protects you. You have bacteria on your skin living there. Most of it is healthy, a lot of it's not. And even the healthy stuff, if it gets into your body in a place that it's not supposed to, it can get you sick. Um, e. coli is one, right? It's a helpful bacteria that lives in your gut, but if it gets into your bloodstream, you've got major problems. Okay, so we can classify burns into different types based on the severity of the burns. First degree is damages restricted to the epidermis only and they're characterized by redness. So a sunburn um, would be first degree burn. Tender to the touch, you've damaged the underlying tissues but you haven't gone any farther than the epidermis. Second degree burns would be epidermis in the upper dermis, so like that papillary layer. This is where you get blisters uh, involved. And then third degree burns is damage to the full thickness of the skin all the way through the dermis to that uh, hypodermis, that connective tissue layer down at the very bottom. Um, various infections can occur like we talked about with the threats to life. Uh, dermatitis is a very common uh, disorder that's caused by some sort of irritant, typically an allergy. Um, so this is gonna look like a rash, basically, uh, as well as skin cancer is a very um, significant problem. So here are the different burns uh, uh, and, and what they look like. So first degree burns, that's your sunburn, redness only. Uh, second degree, bur degree burns, there was blistering with, you can see the blisters in here. Here are your blisters. And then the third degree burns, there's extensive damage going all the way to the, um, all of the dermis. So the dermis is destroyed, the epidermis is destroyed, and m more often than not, part of the hypodermis is also damaged and destroyed. And so basically what you're doing is you're creating huge openings for infectious pathogens to come into your body, directly into your bloodstream. And that's a, it's really, really difficult to fight infections when they come in this way. It's very difficult for the body to mount a response because the pathogen moves very, very quickly at that point. Uh, critical burns are burns that occur over 10% of the body. If, uh, if over 10% of the body has third degree burns, okay. Uh, another criteria is 25% of the body has second degree burns or uh, there are third degree burns to the face, the hands, or the feet. All very sensitive, all very important areas. And so basically uh, what medical professionals will do is they'll use the rule of um, nines. And so if you look at this, these are all basically um, multiples of nines based on the total skin area. So if 9% of any given area has burns on it, then we consider them um, critical burn. So 9% of the skin area of the legs, 18% uh, because that surface area is a, is a little bit, is the greatest. The 18% arms and head are lower, so those are 4.5%, but they're all basically multiples of 9. Uh, dermatitis, that uh, condition where the skin becomes red and swollen um, and sore, sometimes there's small blisters, it's typically because of direct irritation by some sort of irritant or some sort of allergic reaction. So 
Uh, if you come in contact, let's say you're allergic to fab some sort of fabric softener, when you come in contact with it, it with your skin, you get um, rashes, basically, wherever you've come in contact with it. Um, reaction to poison ivy is very similar to this, uh, if you're looking for some way to sort of connect it in your head. Uh, skin tumors. T um, tumors. So tumors are cancer, right? We looked at that in um, the cell cycle video. Cancer comes about from uncontrolled cell division. Now, if they're not, if they're harmless, that's also known as benign. So your uh, warts, for example. Uh, most of the time, skin cancer is going to be associated with uh, UV exposure, but also skin aging as you accumulate um, damage and stuff like that. Uh, once it starts to spread, then it becomes a real problem. All right, so once a cancer stops being benign, then it starts becoming a problem, right? So um, you can have different types of cancers. Uh, uh, actinic keratosis is a type, it's pre-malignant, so it's not benign, that means it's actively growing. Because like warts, you get a wart and it grows to a certain extent, but if you leave it alone, it doesn't grow anymore. Like it just, it reaches a certain point. Now you always want to monitor it, right? Um, and there's an acronym that you can use to do that. But if it doesn't change, then typically a lot of people will leave it alone. And there's procedures you can do to have them removed. Um, uh, Pre-malignant would be you're starting to get to see some of these changes, but malignant means it, it, it spreads to other tissues, right? That's what you wanna to try to avoid. Other types of cells, you've got basal cell, uh, which affects cells of the stratum basale. You've got uh, 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 squamous cell, which is going to attack the keratinocytes. Melanoma is going to attack the melanocytes. And that's the most dangerous one because it spreads, it develops quickly and it spreads very, very rapidly. Those are, so these are the most common types of cancer. And so there's a, that acronym that I just mentioned, how you can recognize that. You can do A, B, C, A, B, C, D, right? So A, asymmetry. And you want it to be, if it's a wart or a mole or a freckle, it's a circle, more or less a perfect circle. Once that changes, you need to be concerned. Border irregularity. So you should be able to look at like a freckle or something like that. And there's a clear demarcation between the dark spot and the light spot. Okay, um, if that starts to get fuzzy or irregular, then you want to get you want to look that up. Colors. If you start getting changes in colors, multiple colors in the same spot, then you want to go get some help. Diameter larger than six millimeters. So six millimeters um, is almost almost a centimeter. Uh, a, you know, a centimeter is. Uh, let's say a third of an inch or something like that. So uh, that's kind of large, about the eraser head. If it's a, a little you know, bigger than an eraser head, then you wanna go in. And the more of these that you see, the more urgent it is that you need to go and have it checked out because uh, it can turn into, melanoma especially, can turn into something really, really bad, really, really fast. So here's some, dis, uh, here's some pictures. And so based on the type of cell that is being affected, it looks very different. But if you look at the melanoma, um, it's a dark spot because those melanocytes are growing uncontrollably, which means you have it, that increased production in the melanin in that area. So that basically does it for the skin. Um, so as far as the project is concerned, and we've already discussed this, so I'm just reiterating this point, um, you're going to be applying what you know about the different cell types and the different layers to whatever disease you, um, or as you selected. And so you're going to give us a very clinical description using the technical terms that we just covered here to describe what's going on with your particular illness. And then you're going to present that to us. Um, and so that's what we're going to be working on for most of this stuff. Um, go back and review this if you need to. If you have any questions, send me a, me send me a remind message, send me an email. Um, otherwise, I look forward to seeing you all again soon.